trust uh, everyone as well and hope you can hear and see me uh, appropriately. Um, good afternoon and um, uh, it's a real delight to welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, discussion. I guess um, by way of introduction, my name is Salman Jaffrey. Uh, I am responsible for business development here and over the next few minutes, not exceeding maybe three or four, I would like to play host and welcome everybody to today's conversation and maybe provide a little bit of context and commentary to set the stage for a very distinguished group of people from Kalantar Business Law Group, Alvarez and Marsal, ADCB and Rothschild, of course, Hassam, Saeed Esteban and Saeed, uh, who you will all get to know and whose opinions we are anxiously awaiting. Look, uh, let me set the stage a little bit here to say uh, at the risk of repeating what a lot of webinars are talking about right now, clearly uh, we live in a different world today. Things are different. The fact that we're having this engagement digitally and quite comfortable doing so things have changed. Um, we must find this uh, walk this fine line between uh, trying to extrapolate what's going to happen in the future and also kind of dealing with what's uh, changing today. And I think uh, the right balance that we've seen is to uh, adapt as quickly as we can to the change of circumstances and be prepared for just about you know whatever uh, the markets throw our ways. The reality is, from what we've seen, uh, a lot of these structural and strategic shifts uh, are still ongoing in the markets, and we're very keen to hear what our experts have to say. But clearly, in the short run, a, a number of shall we say, tactical or operating, uh, operating model changes have definitely happened. So, for example, the fact that uh, the digital agenda has been significantly accelerated across the board, whether you're a corporate banker or a retail banker or a restructuring person or an advisor or a consultant, right? Clearly, um, there's a different engagement, a different mode of engagement happening. But I think it'll be really interesting to see um, strategically and structurally how uh, the economic impact of COVID pans out uh, globally and in the region. Uh, let me spend a minute and just recap kind of what we saw. I see naturally, like like everybody else, uh, March, April, May was was very challenging for everybody. Uh, most importantly, for our clients, uh, for our community. Like everybody else, we buckled together and we uh, tried to enforce successfully the. Uh, the rules of engagement on how to operate, uh, you know, uh, within this air, you know, within the business environment in terms of ensuring the health and security of our constituents. I think that that um, process went on for the first couple of months. Obviously, we were uh, we played an important role in executing the government's plan to for fiscal support for sectors that happened. Um, but it was clear initially that a few things were were, were, were were very clear. The first thing was that this was something which was going to disproportionately impact big clients versus, uh, sorry, small clients versus big. So across our sectors uh, in financial services, as well as in non-financial services, clearly we we felt the ripples of discomfort um, hit our, uh, our smaller constituents, probably dis dis disproportionately versus our larger, uh, our larger constituents. Um, we, we saw an initial uh, micro focus on working capital issues, uh, particularly for smaller companies, um, week to week, month to month cash management. Uh, we've seen that evolve now as the dust has a little bit subsided into larger questions of funding and financing rather than just working capital. Although, again, I, I look forward to um, the, uh, the views of our experts. Um, if you look at balance sheet versus off balance sheet, I can say with um, with some confidence that there is a period when the markets fell by about 15 percent that had our wealth and asset managers and 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 private bankers quite concerned uh, that was a moment of significant stress uh, for them but after the market subsided um, I, I think many of our asset managers and wealth managers felt like it was better to be in a kind of non-balance sheet environment with a fee-based business notwithstanding the usual uh, volatility that the markets had from a uh, banking perspective, look, um, I can only report on the data thus far. So the year on year data on our banking balance sheet has been actually remarkably solid in the sense that um, if there has been pain, it has not yet rippled through uh, the system in any measurable way, which is not to, again, uh, understate what may be coming. But again, I, I look forward to hearing uh, our views, the views of, of our 
um, uh, of our experts. And of course, last but, last but not least, um, you know, it, it was interesting uh, to see the perspectives that that vary between a creditor and borrower. And again, dynamics vary by the size uh, of the liability, the the sector covered. Um, and so it'll be interesting to, to get those views. I guess let me close out my 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 statements by saying uh, we have definitely seen uh, a significant uptick in restructuring. It, it's probably worth defining what that term means for us, the DIFC. Of course, we're not practitioners uh, like our guests are, but I mean, we have seen uh, in no particular order restructuring manifest itself in a number of different ways, ranging from clients looking to um, space out their payments to vendors or to suppliers or to clients. Um, we've seen corporate actions. We've seen um, different areas uh, for changing of ownership uh, with with uh, with companies. We have seen the buying and selling of companies, their units, their subsidiaries. We've seen recapitalizations. We have seen uh, private and public companies, so, so, excuse me, uh, small and big companies uh, or uh, uh, corporate and, 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 and individual companies look to protect or ring fence corporate or personal assets ranging from corporate assets to wealth. We've seen, we've seen that. We've seen an increase in the use of foundations. We've seen an increase in the use of structures. So um, broadly speaking, all of those activities uh, for us are under the guise of restructuring. And so it's been a very interesting area. So let me now um, uh, stop and um, uh, make sure that we pass on the floor to our, uh, our, our panel. Thank you very much for your time. I, I trust today will be an informative conversation. And let me pass on the mic and the floor to uh, Hassam Kalantar to take it forward. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Salman, for that introduction and a good afternoon to all um, and to our distinguished speakers today on the panel. I'm going to give a very quick introduction about myself and I'm going to ask uh, panelists to then each introduce themselves. So very quickly about me, my name is Hassam Kalantar. I am the founder and managing partner of a boutique law firm based in the UAE, active in, in transactional matters predominantly, but we do a fair bit of restructuring work, especially in the SME space, M&A, joint ventures, uh, and we just advise on general commercial matters and on uh, market entry strategies for our European and US clients. Um, I've been practicing law in the UAE for about 12 years, and prior to that I was in the US, and that's where I'll leave it for, uh, for myself. I'm going to hand the, the torch over to our, our first panelist, um, uh, Mr. Saeed Alawar. Saeed? Thank you, Hassan. Um, first of all, uh, thanks for the DIFC for hosting us uh, today. Um, um, just a few words about myself. Uh, I was Saeed Alawar. I, I head uh, Rothschild's Middle East business. Um, and um, within Rothschild, for those who don't know what we do uh, briefly, we obviously cover a wide range of um, um, uh, support that we provide clients, whether it's on the M&A side um, or the restructuring side or, or even in healthy debt advisor situations as well. We also support uh, clients on equity capital market transactions as well. Um, our focus is on the financial advisory side uh, and, and less on the operational side. So we uh, will talk about um, our views and perspectives on restructuring um, restructurings in the region that are that have happened or are about to happen from a financial restructuring perspective. Um, but we have uh, worked on a number of high-profile restructurings in the past, such as Dubai World, Nakhil um, restructuring, um, Al Jabr, which is something I'm sure close to Esteban's heart, um, and, and 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 others that are that are um, that are probably uh, in the works at the moment. Um, uh, I'll probably stop there and uh, pass on to my other panelists. Sure, Esteban, uh, please uh, int introduce yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon all. I mean, uh, again, thank you for the IFC for hosting this event. I mean, my name is Esteban Buljevic. 
Um, I had the workout practice of ADCB. Um, I've been doing restructuring for almost 30 years. My first one was in 1992. I've done uh, this type of uh, work in uh, more than 70 countries, five continents, you know. Uh, but lately, the last five years, I've been uh, based uh, locally in the region. So have basically uh, practiced quite a lot in Thank you, Dr. Saida. You're, you're muted. Dr. Saida, I believe you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Very nice to be here today. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Saida Jaffa, and uh, I head up Alvarez and Marcel for the region um, covering all of uh, GCC. My personal background is in operational restructuring a &M, as many of you might know, is known to be one of the world's largest restructuring firms. We've done a lot of work internationally for the likes of Lehman's and locally NMC and, uh, and many others uh, going on. So very nice to be here today and inshallah look forward to a very good conversation. Terrific, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saida, uh, Esteban and Saeed. Um, Esteban, I'm gonna start with you. You know, you're obviously uh, one of our interesting panelists in that you are at a bank, at a local bank, um, and so you are very much in the thick of in the thick of things in terms of trying to explore uh, restructuring solutions um, uh, with with your borrowers. So I think the place to start is of the land so far as restructuring is concerned today what's what's driving it is is there any true to the to the to the sense that there is a wave of restructurings arriving or soon to arrive what's your take on all of that well i mean um, the, the the landscape as as, as uh, salman uh, in his introductory note uh, uh, noted i mean uh, uh, it's quite unique. I mean, when you when you see previous uh, regional, local, or or, or global uh, crises, you know they were generated by by factors. You know, were were generally either from a, a, a macroeconomic uh, issue, a fiscal issue, a monetary issue, or a financial system matter. The, this one is, is 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 a very unique situation because first is a global situation second is not deriving from a, a, a monetary fiscal or financial uh, market uh, crisis but it's rather deriving from a different factor uh, if you think about it the world was doing quite well before COVID-19 uh, and uh, when COVID hit you know it hit it hit the 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 the, the bone of 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 the real sector not just the financial sector. So with that, I mean, I, I, when you think about restructuring, restructuring are basically, uh, you restructure the capital structure. So basically restructuring are basically predicated on, 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 on finding solutions to, to, on the capital structure, basically on the balance sheet of a company. In this case, I mean, while all of that is and will be needed, the more fundamental question is, <clears throat> it comes not, not just from the balance sheet, it comes from, you know, the, 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 the companies in general are suffering on all their fun statements, you know, they are suffering on the balance sheet, of course. In the region, generally speaking, they are suffering more because the sector, in general speaking, the sector was over leveraged before the crisis. But, but more fundamentally, you have the, 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 the now the landscape of, of each of the companies, depending on the sectors, are facing structural challenges and even business model challenges on their P&L. Uh, and, and also that which translate in the, in the, into their cash flow statement. So basically at the moment, uh, it is quite obvious that, uh, that most companies will require some level of, 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 of a solution on their capital structure, whether it's a reprofiling, a hardcore restructuring, you know, uh, an M&A solution, a combination of, uh, but more fundamentally, I think that the, what we need to think about now, and this is why 
the, the restrictions have not started. That's why you have regulatory reliefs in most countries, in most, in most regions, including in this country. You know, in the end, the essence is uh, companies need to understand what is their new business model. What, what, what? Uh, in, in some cases, you know, the 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 the, the, the situation has changed so so dramatically that uh, they may not have a business model. They might need to change, uh, following Darwin, you know, survival of the fittest, you know. So, I feel that you know the the restructuring uh, work will come, but will come after the operational turnaround uh, and and the business redefinition exercise. You know, it it, it doesn't make sense to work out. The capital structure of a company, the company is not viable. It doesn't make sense to figure out how much you can support if you don't know uh, what is the business plan and how much cash flow can, can uh, how much EBITDA, which translates to cash flow, the, the company has can generate. Uh, you know, so so the whole thing is 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 a fantastic challenge. It's it's a it's, a, it's an inter, interactive and multidisciplinary challenge. It will not just be. Uh, you know, it's a, I think that if that's why the panel that we have today is, is extremely uh, interesting because we have, uh, you know, from the investment banking perspective, from the operational performance improvement perspective, and the business strategy perspective to the to the more uh, debt restructuring, you know, balance sheet uh, aspect. But the three elements are important. Just to think that we will only uh, work out solutions by focusing on the balance sheet is, is kind of a narrow and simplistic approach. Uh, I think that it will take a little bit of time because with the second wave of COVID, uh, people are still, first of all, like digesting things. It's, it's not easy to digest uh, so many things happening at the same time, you know, so you need to understand. Then uh, you need to figure out uh, what is your strategy. Some, some, some people and some companies are, are reacting faster than others. As I say, we'll, the, the, the whole ecosystem will follow Darwin if you are too slow. And you you fail to take the right decisions, you know you're likely to go out of business. But uh, again, fundamentally speaking, the the exercise that any entity needs to need, that any entity needs to follow is, is 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 an exercise that needs to be strategic, needs to focus on 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 on, on new business models, new ways of doing business. They need to be very proactive, you know, they need to close units, they need to close verticals, or they need to reshape them, they need to adjust to cost, they need to adjust to performance, all of these things are important at the same time. And perhaps in the end, uh, working on the balance sheet, it, it will be a natural consequence of all these exercises. Super. Um, there's a couple of things you said, Esteban, that I want to pick up on. I want to turn it over to Said, uh, because Said, obviously, you know, as an M&A specialist, you have worked on some landmark transactions, uh, including um, acting for or being involved with uh, the sale and acquisition of, of government-owned entities. My question to you is, uh, well, there's two, two questions. Are you seeing the strategies that are driving the M&A that you've been advising on um, being a fallout or a consequence of the desire to restructure or the need to restructure? In other words, isn't, is your M&A ancillary to a wider drive towards these companies uh, embracing a restructuring solution? Question one and question two, I wanted to get your, your opinion on, also on, on the state of leverage and if you agree that altogether there's been uh, generally too much leverage, the banks have been too generous in recent years, and that's part of the problem. So, so I think let's start with the second question, perhaps first. And I think what we need to uh, r realize is that this problem is not a COVID problem. The problems, uh, I would say problems first started, I mean, we, we focus on leverage quite a bit. These, these businesses have also raised a lot of debt when their profitability was much higher. So if we look at 2000, pre-2015, um, profitability, profitability recovered quite quickly on relative terms after the financial crisis in the region. All prices were high, businesses recovered, debt was taken to expand, to refinance for, for many reasons. And what has happened since 2015 um, is what, you, what we've all experienced is a, is a slowdown that has started since 2015. And businesses, whether they're family groups, corporates, or even government entities, have all experienced 
um, this relative slowdown. Um, and what has happened now is, uh, I think for a lot of people that we speak to, um, they saw a, a stabilization probably in 2019 and, and some recover, signs of recovery. And unfortunately, um, obviously it's out, out of everyone's control, when things just managed to stabilize, and when I say stabilize, they're not stabilized at the levels pre-15, they're st stabilized, meaning they're not dropping anymore. Um, then COVID came and things got worse. I think we need to look at two parts of the equation. There is the leverage that is usually in a lot of these cases historic. Um, and there's the profitability of these businesses and the sustainability as it goes to Esteban's point um, about restructurings. Sometimes the business model is no longer viable and there is no longer restructuring to even talk about. Um, sometimes the business is just going through a cyclical issue um, and in some sectors, even within the construction sector, there are some elements of, I would say, medium term potential recoveries on some sectors within construction. So, so I, you'll have to look at these things, I would say, sector by sector, there are different dynamics for each sector, whether it's real estate related, whether it's healthcare, um, education. Yes, it's all in some shape or form connected, but they're all going through different dynamics. Um, and I think we need to assess each of them. And my point is you need to look at profitability, uh, which I'm sure we'll go on to the, uh, later, later on in the discussion to talk about sustainable business plans and what, how people should think about those. And uh, Saida can talk about can talk about that talk about that topic uh, much more credibly than I can. Um, and then the other question um, is is going forward, what do you do with this excessive leverage? Um, the next question you talked you, you asked about is on, on the M&A front. Now. The solutions to difficult situations is not always insolvency. Um, but we see that in different uh, different uh, situations. Sometimes coming together with another asset that is probably healthier from a capital structure perspective can help alleviate or resolve the issue. Um, some of the it, it really comes down to again. I would say, is there a business? viability, is this business sustainable in the long term, um, and does it have a, 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 a tolerable amount of leverage that an M&A, that, that an M&A transaction makes it, uh, makes it make sense? Do we see signs of this happening? The answer is yes. Um, we do see an increasing level of, um, of, of appetite to, to consider potential consolidation. It's not an easy topic. Um, in any way, for bringing two, three parties together is not an easy topic, it's not an easy exercise, um, but we do see elements of that coming up and people thinking about coming together to be more resilient going forward. Clear, clear. So the, so the, so the, the maybe controversial label of distress M&A that you hear mentioned on the street, some that would potentially apply to the sorts of deals you've been advising on uh, at least to some, if not all, where there's a, there's liquidity concerns, perhaps, or, or um, is that fair to say? I, I, I wouldn't say that the transactions we were involved in were distressed in any shape or form. I think what I would say is, do, do we see transaction flows in the market uh, that have signs of distress? Yes. Um, are there, are there um, and I think it goes to Esteban's point as well, a lot of these corporates, including the government, I think the government is acting extremely proactively in trying to think about solutions for their own assets as well. And, and what they're saying, governments and corporates alike, they're saying, how could we come, the, the market is not going to go back to the pre-2008 levels. It, won't, it may not come back to pre-2015 levels immediately in the, in the medium term. So we need to think about how can we be resilient together and people are thinking about those positions. So they're not, these discussions are not distressed discussions. Um, they're discussions, uh, I would say they're definitely more uh, rational discussions. They're, they're tricky because bringing any two parties together is not always easy. Um, and so it's, I would say it's, it's different in different circumstances. I mean, the distress, to be honest, only comes up, I would say, in extreme, extreme cases where the business has fallen apart. 
or is about to fall apart. Um, I don't think we see that um, prevailing in the market at the moment. There may be one or two circumstances, but otherwise the general sense of the market right now is that there's there may be some, but it's not the um, it's not the I would say the highlight of the market at the moment. It may change, and there's an expectation that this may change next year. Clear, super. That's 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 very interesting, uh, Dr. Saida. Also, I want to turn to you, given your expertise and perhaps more of the operational aspect and sort of the the business optimization techniques that you advise your clients on, uh, given the challenging environment we're in. Um, when I think about business models changing and the viability of businesses coming under the spotlight, I think of, well, I think of some of these legacy industries that are perhaps disproportionately hit, right? I mean, we think of where we are and we've got uh, things like uh, family businesses that are active in, in automotive or commercial leasing, or there's the food and beverage space, the entertainment space, hospitality, and all of, all of those things. Um, and then, of course, we've got the new means of consumption, you know, all this embracing of technology, e-commerce, doing meetings on Zoom and so on. So my question to you, Dr. Saida, are you seeing, are you advising on in both of these areas? Are you advising sort of the legacy, more traditional bit businesses on how to be perhaps more contemporary? Uh, and, and are you advising clients on, on shifting their offerings to meet the behaviors of consumers today? What, what's, what's going on there, uh, there for you? Um, any, any insights you can share? Sure, absolutely. Look, I think what we're seeing is... Uh, across the board between larger organizations as well as family businesses. So if we just step back, right, if we just put this in context and then we will get into the specifics of today, really pre-2008, there was just a lot of growth. And what we saw were large organizations develop, which were probably multiple different kinds of businesses strung together. These could be family businesses, these could be others, right? Large complex organizations strung together. And what would typically be the case is these would be organizations or these would be businesses that were fairly asset heavy, that were fairly integrated and monolithic in, in terms of their value chains. So you, we, there were these, what I would say, traditional clunky businesses put together. Then, we, well, 2009 happened, and frankly, it went down but recovered relatively quickly. And I would say from 2010 onwards, there was a, a change that was sparked across globally, but also very, very much locally, that was around digitization, around the disintermediation of asset heavy and asset light, the owner and the operator mindset. So all these things slowly started building up. And I think you saw the undercurrents of these going until probably about 2015. Then as, as Said and Stefan mentioned, right, there was another a bit of a slowdown in 2015. And that's when you saw a lot of these alternate business models really and truly come to the forefront because they had a lot of the flexibility and the ability to react and respond very quickly, to focus on customers, to focus on what was needed as on experiences as opposed to products. So you saw a lot of these things develop and grow to the point where we are today. Today, if we look at it, if you look at a lot of the, let's say, businesses that have been around for a long time, what we tend to see is there tends to be the business part. That is either a B2B or a B2C business, which still tends to be quite traditional, still tends to be quite integrated and still tends to be asset heavy. In addition to this, if it's especially if it's family office or some of the others, there tends to be a heavy real estate component, a fairly heavy real estate component that's accumulated over time. And these could be either land banks, these could be assets, what, a large number of different things which are not always looked at uh, through the lens of, uh, of commerciality. And then there's usually a third element, which is around all other businesses, is the way we put it. So there is the, the pillar one, which tends to be the, the revenue and the cash generator. Pillar two, which typically tends to be around real estate. And then pillar three, which tends to be a lot of other businesses. What we're seeing today is fundamentally pillar one is under stress. 
and you look across the board, right? These could be traditional things like construction, then these could be more things like uh, retail, you, know, you, know, you name it, right? All these businesses are fundamentally under stress, partly because of people, the changing preferences, the decreasing spending power, but also partly because of digitization. So there, that fundamental pillar one is under stress. Pillar two is real estate. We won't, we don't need to talk about that. I think we all know what's going on in real estate. And then pillar three tends to be these other businesses that are have typically been a dream and are now increasingly being looked at much more critically. So as a result of this, what we are seeing much more is when we go into businesses, we look at them, we look at the portfolio and very clear, very early, very quickly, we can say, look, out of the portfolio that you have, this is the group that frankly is not a, a, a viable business model. We don't think that this is either something that's going to be around or something where you are the natural owner. Once we park that, then we say, let's look at the core. And then we look at the core and we say, how do we take that core and make the business model such that it will work? Sometimes there are, there are more temporary issues, but quite often these tend to be, there tend to be issues around, there's a need for digital. There is a need for making the operating model much more flexible so that you minimize your fixed costs. You, you, you try to make things as variable as you can so that you can scale up, scale down as is necessary. And frankly, you manage the finances better, working capital, balance sheet, you name it. So what, that's how we typically try to go in and we try to look at the business from a portfolio view, focus on, frankly, identify the ones where we don't think there is a lot that can be done. And that's where that goes into the divestures. And then where we think there is opportunity, there is potential, we go in and we fix the business models in the way that needs to be fixed so that operationally the businesses can survive and then eventually thrive. Terrific. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Esteban, I'm going to switch gears uh, and go back into financial restructuring um, for a little bit. And I want to sort of explore a little bit how an actual restructuring sort of plays out um, in the region. So I suppose my first question, given that you're at a bank, is, is typically how do banks sort of react in the face of a default? I mean, obviously it differs from case to case, depending on the magnitude and, and the nature of the default, but how do banks set about exploring solutions and engaging with with the debtor is, is are, are we increasingly adopting the best practices that we're seeing in more developed markets or is it still each bank for for themselves um what has been your experience i mean uh, um the it is obvious that uh, that the the, the, the market uh, and, and the, the financial sector in the region have uh, somewhat developed you know and evolved uh, uh, in the last 10 years, you know, uh, after the 2008-9 crisis and uh, and subsequent issues that we're facing, as to how uh, uh, banks react, I mean, it's a little bit uh, difficult to say because banks have different styles, you know. But generally speaking, uh, we need to understand something. Banks are not in the business of promoting financial restructuring. Banks are in the business of recovering impaired assets, you know, because their business is to, to protect their own investment. So when you face... Uh, when you face a, a situation where one of your assets is impaired, what you want to do is to recover your money, not to promote best practices of, on financial restructurings. And, uh, and for that, banks generally will follow a recovery matrix model. I mean, whether they, they do it intuitively or, or whether they do it out of uh, proper training, you know. First of all, when you face a, a distress situation, the first question that you pose is, uh, are we facing an issue of willingness to pay or ability to pay? And uh, in the region, unfortunately, half of the times you have an issue of willingness to pay more than ability to pay, in which case banks uh, don't focus that much on, 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 on financial restructuring and following proper uh, insult principles of the staff or the like, because they, they know that the, 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 the borrower or counterpart or sponsor could pay, you know, if they wanted to. OK, uh, then, uh, of course, the matrix also follows to to a logic uh, understanding whether it's good faith or bad faith. Uh, you have many cases where you have flagrant bad faith, whether it's fraud or quasi fraud. So that also will dictate to what is your approach in the third. Also, you know what 
you you need to understand in, in many instances you will you will follow as well you will need to analyze what is the debt the debt burden capacity of your of your counterpart and what is your collateral so i mean uh, i would say a key, key, banks will follow and determine a strategy on the basis of uh, multiple factors again when you have <coughs> a lack of lack of willingness to pay banks will become quite hostile and uh, and many counterparts will want to protect behind uh, these uh, workout insult principles of stuff like that uh, but going back to the to the core of this uh, to, to of this seminar which I, is basically a case where you have a good face counterpart facing genuine financial distress which is in a way opposing challenges on its ability to pay and requires support from banks uh, generally speaking, you are talking about multi-creditor processes. So in those cases, I would say that depending on the scale of the cases, uh, banks uh, have, uh, have evolved, and uh, we have seen over time that it's easy, or it's, 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 I wouldn't say easy. It, it, is, uh, it is possible to work with banks on a, on a coordinated way. When it comes to uh, mean market and, uh, you know, it, 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 it becomes more complicated. Uh, banks generally uh, would not, uh, be, perhaps because of staffing issues or the type of uh, relationship managers that handle accounts and stuff like that. But I would say when a, a company in the mid market sector faces uh, financial distress, it generally has a higher challenge in bringing together banks, you know, and working out solutions. Right. The bigger, I, in a way, the bigger, the better in terms of. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious to know, like we've heard and we've seen significant reforms in recent years, right? Where, you, where you've got, for example, the, the mainland UAE bankruptcy law of 26. So you, you would think that these reforms are are at least increasing the option of solutions so far as debtors are concerned. And I'm just curious to know if that has moved the needle at all. Are you seeing more business rescue initiatives like uh, uh, like rehabilitation, basically, uh, being deployed today, whereas in the, in the past it wasn't really an option? I mean, I must say that uh, the, this is, a, 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 this is a something, uh, an area where uh, there is a need for, for doing more. Uh, yes, there has been a, a, a bankruptcy law issue in the past. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, there is a need to do more. Um, the, the, it's not just having a law. You need to have a law. You need to have the infrastructure, the judicial infrastructure. You need to have the culture. You need to have an, a, you know, an environment conducive to, to promoting uh, financial rescues in court or out of court. Uh, as, you, as you know, as you may have seen, uh, most cases have been out of court. <clears throat> it's difficult to work cases out of court where they are when they are large, complex, and multi-creditor driven. Um, so I feel that the, 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 one of the one of the hot topics of restructuring in the region is is as to how to develop or further develop and how to really grease uh, processes, where judicial processes, whether it's offshore or onshore processes. You know, this is key. Uh, you see in Saudi enacted the law later than the UAE, and, uh, but it, it seems to be working a little bit better. I mean, it, mm -hmm. you have some cases that are there and are working. Uh, so there is a need to do more. I think that this is, uh, in my view, is the, is the, is the key theme uh, in the, in, of the next few years, you know, because this is key. Can, can I perhaps, Hassan, there's a couple of points that I thought would be useful follow-ups to what Esteban said. Uh, and and, and it's, it's to answer the questions you also raised. Is, uh, Esteban gave a very good view of how he sees life from a creditor perspective. The other thing that we, we look at is when, um, when we come into a situation where we're asked whether it's de-stress or stress, um, there could be different, obviously, varying levels. I think the first thing in any of these general processes that we think about, the first thing that people need to assess and what we need to assess is whether there's a short-term liquidity issue, because that will quite quickly determine how bad the situation is. If we don't have an issue in the next, um, I would say, 12 weeks or three months, 
then then we can at least breathe a bit better and think about a more long-term solution. If you have an issue in the next 10 to 12 weeks, then there is a more pressing point and you need to think about different options, which we will cover later on. Um, th then we move on, I would say, and, and this is this is a general approach. And the reason I talk about this is I think preparation and preparedness of, of corporates before they go and speak to banks is always very important. A lot of the issues that that uh, that Esteban refers to could get fleshed out in this initial phase. Um, and, and the role that we play and uh, and, and Saida uh, also plays it. We work together on some things, but when we when we look at this, we, we do challenge corporates. We have to. Um, it's our role to play as if we are the creditors um, and give them the perspective of what the banks will be expecting to hear. And so a lot of this work gets done ahead of approaching the banks. We need to look at short term liquidity. We need to look at the business plan. Um, is, this a, is it a sustainable business plan? Is it realistic? Um, can it really be achieved? Should it be sensitized a bit more? Uh, I think those assessments, which we do collaboratively with the likes of A&M, um, um, gets us to a good footing of what, where, does this business, where is this business heading? How much cash does it need? And then once you determine cash requirements or cash outflows that you have and, and, and how much you have cash left to service debt, then we start thinking about the capital structure options. And we, we would obviously have to look at what loans um, are on the balance sheet, what other creditors sit on their balance sheet as well. And we need to find a, a solution that could be, um, could be accepted by the other side to the extent possible. Um, it's not always nice, the options I'm sure we present to the banks when we work with them. When, when those options are presented to the banks, I mean, it, it's partly bad news to the banks as well. If the business has issues repaying its debt obligations, but we tried to find um, and work with the company, trying to find the most acceptable solution to the banks. Right. And of course, the challenge. So, so that, 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 yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, Sam. No, no, I'm just saying that obviously the challenge that we're all that's facing everyone these days is getting a reliable business plan out of the borrower, right? Because there's so much uncertainty out there that uh, the business plan that's going to underpin the ability to service that debt will have to be so scrutinized and everyone's sort of taking a gamble uh, at, at trying to put the line in the sand. A hundred percent. And I'll let, I'll let Saida comment on that in a second. The only last point I would comment on is I would put my voice with Esteban and, and say that we do need, in the UAE specifically, we do need some, and I know there has been some recent change to the bankruptcy law. Um, um, we're, we're still getting to, the, to, to grips with what that entails. We saw also some good initiatives around checks. I think that's helpful. That's a helpful, um, I would say, wider reform of of of, of the creditor market, um, but I think we need more. I, I would say the DIFC definitely has a framework that is quite helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. We did see uh, in the NMC case that the ADGM courts were used. Uh, the question I have is could the DIFC be used for some of the large scale um, insolvencies or, or restructurings? Um, the challenge that we have, Hassan, whenever we face financial restructurings, and this is the, no criticism to the banks, but it, it, there is there's really no tools that are available. Um, the tools are quite weak that are available to a, a borrower to herd the banks together. And one small bank could become the, your biggest problem. And so without a solution, without the tools to, to bring the banks together or force them to accept the solution, uh, you're, you're held in this restructuring discussions that take years to get resolved, which is not helpful not even to us. And people think that this is helpful to us as advisors. No, it's not. It's the contrary. We actually don't like things to get to drag for too long. So, so look, they, this is uh, this is the other point that I wanted to make. Maybe uh, Saida can comment on the business plan point because it's definitely on the minds of a lot of no, people. No, no, no. Absolutely. I want to bring Dr. Saida in uh, to to talk uh, to talk about that and also to talk about you know perhaps other factors that are exasperating the problem maybe in the space of governance at the at the board level or perhaps you know timely and accurate and reliable information being shared among stakeholders 
so the question to you, to you, Doctor, say is uh, is you know where are the gaps uh, that you think are perhaps exasperating the problem? Obviously, interested to hear what you have to say about the business plan uh, point, but also are there ed other sort of impediments that that uh, that creditors that that worsen the problem for creditors? Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, I think on the business plan and on the on the governance, right? I think there is always, um, unfortunately, a mindset around we don't want to give too much bad news. We don't want to really and truly talk about things before they happen. I think the reality is, and I, and Stefan would uh, would would sign off on this. Banks and frankly, the markets would rather know once upfront what is going on, what is the reality. They would rather we be conservative and we, you know what, even if we overshoot in terms of how bad we things are going to be, they would rather we have that and frankly get a little bit of good news, more positive later, as opposed to give news today and then six months later go back and then six months later go back. And I think the, the unfortunate mindset is that we tend to be quite often people tend to be much more optimistic and very, very, very hesitant to say, you know what, it actually might be worse than we think it might be, which leads to this continuous feed, continuous issues, continuous pain. So our advice always is, you know, whenever we go in, we look at the business plans and we say, how comfortable are you? If you are really and truly willing to bet the bank and say, yes, we can achieve this, you are still being more optimistic than what we will, you will probably end up. Frankly, build in the buffer, build in a little bit of space because nobody's ever, the banks are not gonna come back to you and say, you told me you won't get to X, you got to X plus, right? And and, and it's, a, it's going to be a painful conversation, just that doesn't matter, just take the pain up front and let's move on. So I think that's that's one very important factor that I would say. And the other thing that we always talk about when we think about the business plans is um, how realistic is it in your context? And this I cannot stress on enough, right? The market may recover, demand may or may not come back, but are you putting your organization in a situation that well, as and when and if things turn, you will be able to react or not? What do I mean by that, right? If revenues go down by a certain amount, what have you done to make sure you minimize the cost? And, and let's not talk about the usual levers of cost reduction that everybody always pulls. There are many, 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 many different ways in which you can make an organization more efficient, right? What have you done as a management team, as board, to make sure that that happens? And that's where a lot of uh, governance also comes into play. Because typically, if you look at it, the way things are reported is it tends to be very, very mathematical. You have the boards, you have the management, you have the auditors, you have the all the advisors, right? And the conversations tend to be very much focused on this is the number, this is what happened last month. The one, they tend to be backwards looking. Two, they tend to be very, very numerically driven if it's there, not insight driven, not action driven as opposed to creating the platform which says, listen, this is where we think the future is going to be. This is where we think the insights is, and therefore we think this, these are the business decisions that we need to drive. So I think it's the it's the need to create that, that very analytic, but also very forward-looking, insightful conversations and discussions with the board, with the management, so that we can all start thinking about the future. We can start thinking about what is it that we can do to try and make sure that we have solutions before they hit us. And frankly, be as practical and as conservative as we can be so that if, you know, bad news comes, we are we are there and we're ready for it. Super, I appreciate that. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I'm just mindful of the time, so I'm going to make sure I get one question out to each of you uh, b before the before the witching hour. Um, I wanted to just make a quick mention to something uh, Saeed said about the fact that in a restructuring scenario, people are not sticking with, you know, Esteban mentioned these insole principles, which are these ethical guidelines as to how creditors and borrowers ought to behave vis-a-vis -vis one another in order to be coordinated and get to a to a solution that benefits everyone. Um, so, 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 and maybe this is a question to you, Esteban. Are you are you not seeing people behaving accordingly? You know, the, doing the standstills and and um, sharing the information and basically 
doing what we have become quite accustomed and seeing in, in you know in European and, and US markets. Um, is it is it still a little bit of a clumsy process in, in trying to to sort out the problem? Um, I think I think basically answer that question because you said there's work to be done in that. But yeah, no, clearly, I mean the the I mean it, it depends on the cases, as I say before. I mean the, uh, for for banks to generally adhere to 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 insult principles. Uh, they, they, you know, they generally do so in very large cases where basically there is some some sense of, uh, um, the, you know, they get very scared. So, so they they don't know what to do. By definition, they they join together. It is unfortunate that in the, you know, still uh, the, the the financial community in the country in the region is is not. Uh, uh, very, you know, it's not it's not it's not one that. Uh, fully cooperate. You always have this this mentality of the holding out the small bank trying to exit fast because the big banks are in trouble. It's a little bit uh, there is a little bit of a cheap culture between banks, um, and uh, and that's that's why it comes back to the issue of of the need for 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 expediting and and and, and really encouraging the mm. ability of companies to resort to judicial or uh, processes whether it's onshore or offshore just so that you know they can get the protection of a moratorium you know uh, right. uh, of a judicial moratorium and they can and they can and can they can after that uh, ensure that the, the the will of the majority can 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 come over the 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 holding out of some uh, usual suspects, you know, that they they hold out. Uh, it it's it's difficult to work out solutions with unanimity all over the world, not just here. Here is much more complicated, as I say. Um, it's difficult to to put uh, to to promote standstills, but in the in the in the region is more difficult. So and and I think that we have been trying for 10, 15 years, you know, to 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 educate the market, and it's a little bit like a roller coaster. When you are moving, you know, you, we are moving forward. We feel that banks are uh, are graduating and are behaving better, and then it goes back to you know, next case, you have the the same patterns of 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 of, of um, you know of not not being uh, you know uh, working in in a way that 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 banks should you know. So uh, this this is the way I see it. Yeah. Um, uh, Said, maybe a question that that uh, to explore the sophistication of restructuring solutions that are that are that are embraced in this day and age. I mean, for example, are you seeing uh, the the role of alternative finance providers, uh, people who would put super senior money in, um, whether they are like opportunistic funds or, or, or distressed funds or are they in the mix at all when it comes to regional restructurings, in your view? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, look, just to give you a quick answer, the answer is yes. Um, we, they, are, they are around. Um, these are predominantly, depending how stressed the situation is, but uh, on varying degrees of stress, there are different pockets of liquidity. Um, uh, the, I would say the more extreme ends is usually hedge funds, hedge, the hedge fund nature of, of funds that, that would come in. Um, I do think a, a, a borrower sh should avoid at all cost of getting to that stage. Um, if you say, if, you, if we talk about probably not completely distressed, but to some extent stressed, um, then there are MES lenders, um, and these are global funds that are willing to provide MES loans um, on preferred structures, et cetera. And these are um, things that we are working on and, and discussions with, and they're all looking at assets in the region. Obviously, it needs to be the right asset. So if we, if someone comes up to us and says, I have a, a bunch of buildings and I'd like a loan, <clears throat> I think things could be a bit <clears throat> difficult. Um, if, obviously, if those if those buildings are have long-term leases with the government entities, then I think the, the, the short answer is depend, it, it really is driven by the quality of the asset. Um, and if the quality of the asset is right, even if it's stressed or distressed, um, institutional global funds would look at it, and there are regional pockets as well um, that would also look at things like these. Super. Um, much, much as I as I suspected, um, uh, Dr. Saeed, and now maybe 
in the last couple of minutes, I'll turn to each of you uh, in turn, uh, Dr. Seda. So I think uh, on your, given your advisory angle to all of this, um, when a company is at that point of distress because they have the liquidity issue or the, there's a pay payment default imminent, um, what are sort of what are your the, your top most sort of urgent advisory uh, deliverables to that entity? I, I know it's a very generic question, but uh, and I guess what I'm trying to get at is what would you improve or what do you think needs to be done to facilitate? Because when when I when I think of corporate restructuring, I'm thinking of it as a solution, right? It's a solution to a problem. It's a it's a way to get to a consensual outcome that benefits as many people as possible without and avoids the uncertainty of litigation and insolvency and all those sorts of things. So, you know, what, what could be done better in your view and what improvements would you be keen to see? Sure, sure. Look, so I think for any company that's in that situation, there's or, or things they might be getting to that situation, there's probably three things that I would say are absolutely critical. Number one is establish a fact base. Make sure you know the truth, understand what's going on financially, operationally. It's not the time to look at the world through rose colored glasses. So make sure you have a real fact base and you are getting the opinion, the advice of those who know to establish that fact base. So it's, it's an informed opinion that you create. That's number one. I think number two is preserve cash, preserve cash, preserve cash. This is essential. And as Saeed mentioned earlier, this will ultimately give you a bit of a lifeline and an alleviate. And if there isn't enough cash, that will run out soon. And then the third thing I would say is, and we have not talked about this much, but it is very, very important, which is around the people side. Make sure that you're both internally in terms of employees, but also externally in terms of suppliers and critical relationships. Those communi that communication is handled and managed appropriately. The worst thing that can happen is your suppliers learning from others. Oh, this one's not getting paid. That one's not getting paid. The lines are going to dry out. Your banks hear something. Your employees hear something. They start leaving. They start going. Then there isn't really a business that's left to sustain and to continue. So I would say that while there are many, many many things that need to be done and can be done if one suspects that's the situation they're in i would say these are the three most critical ones they should do and once there is a much more of a fact base then we can take a more and more thorough thought through next steps words words of wisdom indeed um i i think um we are pretty much at the hour mark so i i may pause at this juncture, and, and i'm not sure if i'm able to uh, see or uh, uh, looking for the question list. Um, uh, I don't know, Mariam. Are you are you able to to curate any of the questions that have that have come in? Um, I'm not sure if I'm looking at in, in the right place here. Uh, Hi, Hassan. Um, I have a, sorry. I have one question. I think that's come in. I, I'm looking at it, and and that is, I think, good one for Esteban. Esteban, are you seeing? Any enforcements? I mean, when when things go wrong, is there any precedence in the region of people actually enforcing on their claims, like enforcing on their security? Does that even happen um, locally? Yeah, of course, all the time. I mean, the the department is much bigger than my department for sure. And uh, truth be told, I mean. Uh, it, it, in, in most cases, uh, uh, there is a need for enforce. There is a need for enforce because, as I say, you have a high levels of unwillingness to pay. Uh, and, and in most cases, so as I say, I mean, uh, the, the financial restructuring again is, is one is one is one approach to 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 account that is impaired. It's not the only approach. And uh, and uh, most like most in many instances, you know, enforcement is the right thing, whether because you want to improve behavior and you want to mm -hmm. and you want to force a solution that your counterpart is not willing to accept, or whether because you know you there are no grounds to working of the solution. So the, you need certain uh, uh, again. I mean, it's, it's going back to a restructuring book, but you know, financial restructuring is are a solution 
that is, is a, a very good one to preserve going conserve value, but there are not, uh, it's not a one size fit all for proposition. Banks enforce and enforce a lot here. Uh, more, you need to understand that the most of the, the, the lending practice in the region is secure, is a secure base, and, right. and it, it carries security, tangible security, and it carries personal guarantees, and banks will enforce personal guarantees, we will enforce security, and, and also carries checks, which uh, introduces a, a more complex dimension because of the, the criminal nature of uh, bounce checks, you know, which is something that I hope that changes over time, you know. Right, right. And a lot has been done in that space, including the, the personal insolvency law of, of, I think, this year that is trying to decriminalize that sort of thing and allow even a person individually to, to uh, agree an outcome with, with their creditors. Um, if you ask me, I mean, I think that to, to, to improve the, the healthiness of the financial sector, uh, you know, the, 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 there is a need to stop the criminalization of che bounce checks and also uh, I would argue that the personal guarantee should be forbidden, you know, so that banks will focus more on on the creditworthiness of a particular uh, loan, you know, because now banks, the, 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 the lending practices of banks need to improve as well. I mean, the financial distress is the flip side of the coin of bank lending because you have many cases where you are your asset is impaired because you, you basically lend wrongly and badly. Mm -hmm. Other cases, you, 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 you made the wrong loan and then for... for 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 subsequent reasons, your 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 borrower faces distress. In which case, you need to work out a solution. But if you cannot work out a solution, if if if, if you did a bad loan, if there is a bad loan, you, it becomes a more complex proposition. Understood. No, that's that's very that's very compelling, and and I can totally understand. Uh, I'm going to actually now pause and step back and give a huge uh, thanks to, to, to you, Esteban, Dr. Saida, and Said. I think we've gone over the time, the allotted time slightly. So um, many thanks to the three of you for your insight um, and to the for participating and, and tuning in. I'm gonna hand it back to, to DIFC if you are still on. No, we're still on. I mean, literally, thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Hassam and, and our panelists for an amazing conversation. I think we all learned a lot and look forward to perhaps doing, doing it again and seeing how things have progressed since uh, today's conversation. Thank you, everybody.